In this new series about multimeters, I'm going to show you how to purchase one that's going to suit both your pocket and your needs. And then when you get it home and lovingly unwrap it out of its packaging, how to use it correctly. Let's get into it. Last time we did a bit of a trip down memory lane. Remember Donald McCady back in 1923 came up with his AVO meter. That's right, this little bad boy would change the lives of technicians everywhere. This time we're going to discuss the difference between analog meters and digital meters and what might suit you personally. One problem associated with analog meters is the parallax error. This is where you look at a needle and if you don't look at it face on, you can actually get the incorrect reading this way or this way. Take an example, you're cruising down the road and you look over at the person driving and it appears that they're doing 110 kilometers an hour in a 100k zone. Well, the way they look at it, it's exactly on 100k's but due to parallax error, you're seeing 110 k's. It's exactly the same in this situation here. So they have cleverly put in a little mirror to make sure that you can see that the needle is in the correct position. How does that work? So they're not just designed to make sure that, hey, you can get your hair looking schmick. Hmm, I'm gorgeous. If we look at our needle head on, you can see that there's no reflection in the background in the little mirror. But if we just go off to one side a little bit, hang on, there he is there. That's a no-no. That's parallax error right there. That will give us an incorrect reading on our scale. If we cruise back over the other side, same principle applies. You can see the reflection of the needle in the background. So we don't want that. So always you have to read a meter 90 degrees or head on. That way it will give you more of an accurate reading. Analog meters use what's called a moving coil. If we cruise down a little bit, you can see the actual coil in action. That there is a moving coil. Eh, come on, Max, what the hell is a moving coil? How does that make my analog meter move? A moving coil uses the principles of electromagnetism. Let me explain. Electromagnetism is where we pass electricity through a coil of wire wrapped around a soft iron core. This in turn will create an expanding magnetic field. Let me demonstrate. If I put on a compass there that's based on my phone, I don't have another compass, sorry. And now I'm just about to turn on the power, 12 volts DC. Can you see that? I'm switching it off and on. And we can see that we're getting a magnetic field based on the electricity passing through that coil of wire. That's the principle that the moving coil in the analog meter uses, electromagnetism. One thing with analog meters is that they need to be centered to make sure that the needle is pointing in the right direction. In this case, I'm going to measure 20 volts over on this scale here, 0 through to 20 volts. My 20 volt scale or my connection is here and my ground connection is here. But I do need to make sure that this is centered properly. For instance, you can see if I was going to do another setting, if I was going to do my milliamp scale, the zero scale would be here or the zero point would be here and therefore I would need to adjust my setting here. But in this case, I'm going to measure 20 volts so I need my zero put right back there. 20 volts there, zero volts there and I'm going to put 12 volts to it. Let's have a look and see what it does. Okay, we've got, well, it's a bit over 12 volts, isn't it? Is it 12 volts, uh, 12 volts point two, 12 volts point three. Look, honestly, I don't know, I can't see it. Any thoughts? You can see the accuracy of a digital multimeter is far more concise. We can see it's 12.39387. But look, uh, it could be anything here and it depends how I set up my zero point, etc., etc., for the analog meter. So look, the digital wins in that point. But the analog actually has a few advantages that the digital does not. I'm now going to use a thing called a function generator to show you the differences between analog and digital. This fella over on the left will give me a pulsating voltage going into these meters here and here, my analog one and my digital one. So if I just turn it off, I'm actually putting in four hertz. So four times a second, I'm putting in uh, 12 volts, but it's being pulsed. And you can clearly see here that the analog meter is doing its best to keep up. It's doing a pretty good job. It's showing me that it's reaching roughly around about the 12 volt mark before it goes down 
to hopefully get to six volts before it gets pumped up again. But this bloke over here is losing his mind, okay? He's telling me one minute, six volts, five volts, no, six volts, five volts, no. The digital multimeter will only give you what's called the sample rate. In other words, how often it will sample it per second. And therefore, if it's done too quick, it will only give you a strange average. I'm sure the sample rates would be much higher on a bench voltmeter. Inside an analog meter, it's not unusual to find a maze of resistors. And that's what's used to create the varying measurements of voltage, current, and resistance. Whereas digital multimeters are a maze of things like resistors, current shunts, uh, what else have we got? Capacitors, uh, diodes, ICs, processing ICs, of course, as well as trim transistors over here, trim pots, so that things can be adjusted um, for more accuracy, fusing, current shunt, the list goes on and on. So digital multimeters are certainly more complex. Even later model analog meters are very, very similar. They still use a configuration of resistors. There's a couple of diodes here, a little cap over there and a fuse, still very basic in their format. There's a tiny little trim pot there too. Notice one thing different about the digital compared to the analog is that this has two sets of batteries. Over here we have a nine volt battery and over here a combined voltage of three volts. If we put it on the one kilo ohm range there, you can see that we have, what's that, three volts there. And if we put it to the 10 kilo ohm range, put him over there, we actually end up with 12 volts. But the milliamp range or the current in this particular range is very, very low. That's why some electronic repairers um, choose to use an analog meter rather than a digital meter. I prefer the digital myself, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on in the future. But there are plenty of electronic repairers out there that much prefer an analog meter. The reason being is that the speed of reaction of the needle, as I mentioned before, is much faster than the digital multimeter over here. That's one advantage that they prefer. You do have to be very careful, however, if you put it in the one kilo ohm range, the current is a little bit higher. In fact, it's probably about 150 milliamps, and yes, that might create problems to sensitive components, especially your surface mount devices. You don't want to blow them to bits, do you? So horses for courses. Me being in the electronics as well as the automotive industry, I prefer the digital multimeter. If you speak to most automotive technicians, they always use a digital multimeter. I don't know of anyone that uses an analog one anymore. I will be focusing on the digital multimeter for my explanations in the future with voltage, current, etc., etc., simply because that's what I have more of, that's what I'm more comfortable with, and that is what I use. But you need to do research for yourself. Another thing you need to do when testing resistance on an analog meter is to zero out your um, ohms adjustment there. And to do that, you've got to put the two leads together like that, short them out. And you can see that the needle hasn't reached the zero uh, configuration there or the zero line there. So we need to adjust it. And as you can see, it's a little bit touchy, this fella. So it takes a few goes to get it fairly right there. I reckon I'm about right there. Okay, I'm now ready to test something. If I don't do that, my resistance measurements will be out. So it's important that you put them together and get your resistance uh, zeroed out. Now, if I shift that to one kilo ohm, you can already see that it's out. I've got to readjust the thing. Bit of a pain. Pretty close to right there. I'll be honest with you, I don't use this fella too much. I only use it for a few measurements and because I wanted to own an analog meter, a modern one, modern-ish, I guess you could say. So I don't know all the tricks of this particular model and of course all the uses that it can be used for. There's plenty of information out there on the internet that will give you confidence if you want to use an analog meter. If you get a chance, get yourself this book, Testing Electronic Components by Justine Yong. This is what got me into electronics in the beginning, reading and studying this book. And of course, you know me, I study absolutely everything. But if you have a look through here, you can see that generally speaking, an analog meter has been used. In most cases, you find measurements done with an analog meter, and Justine does a fantastic job of explaining it to you. All the way through the book, you'll find information with regard to the use of an analog meter, bridge rectifiers, the list goes on and on. Pretty much every section has the analog meter being used. But hey, horses for courses, I'm more of a digital kind of guy, that's just me. But there's great use for an analog meter. 
So is an analog meter better than a digital? That depends on you and what you want to use it for. As I stated already, I'm a digital multimeter kind of guy and you've seen my collection that I have. I now have over 24. Just don't tell Mrs. Miracle, okay? This time we've discussed the difference between a digital and analog meter. And for me personally, it's the digital that wins. But the question remains, what sort of meter do I buy? Do I buy a dear one or a cheap one? What's best for me personally? Do I buy something as expensive as a Fluke, for instance? Or do I settle for something off Banggood? That's what we'll be discussing next video. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget the subscribe, the comment, the like, all those sort of things. Until next time, this is Miracle Max signing off. I will catch you later.